Hello and welcome back to addressing the COVID-19 crisis and open forum webinar series for pharmacists. I'm Michael Hogue, your host and president of the American Pharmacists Association. It is very good to be back with you. It's been a couple of weeks or so since I've been uh, with you. Uh, we're glad to have so many of you who are regulars returning today. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we hope that you find today's program informative. Uh, the webinar today is going to be audio recorded <clears throat> and will be made available after the webinar at pharmacist.com in the coronavirus resources section. Uh, we will talk about CPE in just a minute, but our purpose today is to discuss the latest updates on COVID-19 vaccines. We're going to talk about the clinical considerations for special populations as well as the emerging processes for vaccine approval, allocation, and distribution. Lots of details to cover today, and we have a great panel that was just going to be with us today. Now, as I mentioned, this program is, in fact, going to offer continuing education, uh, and we have uh, four, uh, three core presenters that are with us to talk about the topics, and one of our experts from APHA will join us as well. Dan Zlot is Senior Vice President of Education and Business Development at APHA. Having joined APHA after a significant uh, time at the National Institutes of Health working in cancer research and uh, immunology, uh, we also have Mitch Rothholtz, very familiar to all of you who join us regularly. Mitch is the Chief of Governance and State Affiliates for APHA and also the executive director of the APHA Foundation. But related to this topic, Mitch is the primary liaison at APHA uh, with our federal agencies related to immunizations as well as the many coalitions that are in existence around vaccines. So Mitch has lots of knowledge to share with us here. We also wanna welcome Claire Hannon, executive director of the Association of Immunization Managers. Claire's been with us before on our program and we're glad to have her back today. She's going to give us a lot of details about how these programs are being executed at the state level in terms of the distribution of the vaccines in particular. And we're really excited to have Claire's insights. Hopefully, we'll clarify any questions that you have. Of course, we always enjoy having with us uh, Lisa Bernstein, who's our Senior Vice President of Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs at APHA. She joined APHA staff after a 30 year career with the Food and Drug Administration and has insights that are very deep uh, into the federal processes uh, at FDA. So we'll uh, get to Elisa a little later on as well. Now, as I mentioned to you previously, today's program is going to be offering continuing pharmacist education for those of you who are live on our program today. If you're joining this program uh, after the fact, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, CE is only available for live participation. Uh, Mitch Rothholtz does have disclosures that he provides to you here and all other individuals associated with the development of this program do not declare any conflicts of interest or disclosures. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who are uh, looking for CE, we'll have the CE code for you at the end of today's program. So you'll want to stick around to the very end in order to be able to get your CE code. You won't be able to get the CE code after the program. So do please stick around uh, until we're finished with that today. Our learning objectives are seen on the slide here. And as I've already outlined to you, uh, we're gonna cover a lot of ground today. In addition, let's go on here. We need to get your feedback early on and see what you already know about these subjects before we dive into the topic. So using your response on the screen, tell us what type of vaccine is the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Some people call this the J&J &J vaccine. Some people call it the J&J &J Janssen vaccine. Some people call it the Janssen vaccine. The two manufacturers, Johnson & Johnson and Janssen have partnered together on this recent submission to the FDA. So we'll uh, get your opinions on this. All right, let's move on to the next question. Immunocompromised persons should be counseled on which of the following? So you've got four choices here of things that we should be counseling our immunocompromised patients on as we uh, offer them the COVID-19 vaccine. What are your opinions on this? I'll let you all read yourself there on the screen. 
and pick the answer that you feel most comfortable with. Just a few more of you, please take time to click. There's no penalty for picking or guessing at this stage. We'll share the details with you as we go through the program today. All right, now let's go on. I think we've got maybe one more question. Which of the following is true regarding the initial activation of the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program as of today, February the 11th, 2021? Which of the following is true? And let me just tell you, please read the answers, responses here very carefully. Uh, we're not trying to be tricky, but we do want to be uh, uh, nuanced here so that everybody's more clear on how the federal retail pharmacy program works. So give it your best shot and uh, let's uh, see what your thoughts are here. We're gonna talk a good bit about the federal retail pharmacy program today so that you all are aware of how to participate in that. All right, wonderful. Thank you all for participating. Now, I want to point out to you that uh, the way this program works is that this is a Q&A format. I'll interview our guests. They'll respond to questions and give us some details. We have details we'll share with you in the slides. I also want to tell you that particularly with today's program, we have a number of additional resources that we won't be able to talk about on the program today, but that we've added to the end of the slide deck. And if you click on the handouts tab in the GoToWebinar control panel, you can actually download the handout to your computer. All of the links in the handout are active and you can just go directly to the resource that we've linked to in the, in the uh, slide deck. In addition to that, you can access the handouts and today's recorded webinar at pharmacist.com in the coronavirus resources section. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that and share it with your friends who may not have been able to join on today's webinar, but who may in fact find this information very, very helpful. Now there's a questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'd ask you to, if you have questions, please go ahead and start typing those in now. We received questions in advance of today's call, uh, but we also will take your questions uh, on the air today. And so we want you to go ahead and enter your questions in as you think of them. And then as time allows, we'll try to get as many of these questions addressed uh, as we go on through the program. So there's plenty of time for that. And we'll make sure that we get to all of your questions or as many of them as we can. And I'll just mention to you that we do have an online platform called Engage. We'll talk about it later. If we can't get to your questions today, we'll post those on Engage and try to get responses to your questions through that venue as well. So with all of that, let me ask our guests today uh, to join us. We have Mitch Rothholz and Dan Zlot first, that we're going to talk to them about some breaking news and clinical considerations. So uh, uh, Dan, Mitch, uh, let's get you on the screen and let's start talking about uh, some of these details. Now, I think perhaps, Dan, one of the hottest topics in the news today and the question that pharmacists get most often is about variants. Uh, there's a lot circulating out there about COVID variants. Can you give us a little bit of an update about what's going on with variants? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question and definitely something that we've been getting a lot of questions about and you see it everywhere. So before we start talking about variants, let's talk about why these variants matter so much. And to do that, let's start with a little refresher on immunology. So in particular, we've all been hearing a lot about antibodies and how antibodies are formed in response to COVID infections or to uh, vaccines. So uh, just a quick review on how antibodies work. So um, antibodies really have two main components to them. And this is a simplification, but um, the, the main part of the antibody that does the work um, for COVID is the variable portion of the antibody. That's the part that recognizes the antigen. And it's uh, represented in light blue in the, in the figure there. Now, there's also uh, the constant domain represented in the seafoam green. And that provides kind of a structural backbone and sometimes can serve as a signal for other components of the immune system. But uh, you can see the light portion of the antibody interacting with the antigen uh, portrayed in red in the figure. And so the shape of the antigen and the antibody together are what allow the antibody to really bind to the antigen. So if we can go to the next slide. I like to think of this as a uh, kind of like a, a lock and a key. Um, that's the, the best way that I've found to think of it. So when we start talking about COVID-19 variants, um, in this uh, analogy I'm going to use, the antibody um, is represented by 
uh, the, 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 the lock and the COVID um, variant, if you will, is represented by the key. So in order for a lock to fit into a key, there's two different things that have to happen. First, the, the key itself has to be able to fit into the uh, keyhole. And so you can see kind of the wavy pattern there in the lock, right? So if the overall shape of the key is not right, if it's too long, if it's too narrow, uh, the lock won't go into the key. I'm sorry, the key won't go into the lock. Um, in ad addition to that, there's some finer points, the teeth on the key, that also have to line up just right in order to be able to unlock the lock. So if you think about that analogy, um, what, what's happening here with COVID-19 variants is the overall shape of the key, right, is basically the same, but some of those smaller points that are important for the antibody to be able to recognize the antigen or the, the virus uh, are changing. And so if you change them enough, it might be that the key will kind of fit, but it will not be able to do what it should do and fully unlock the lock. So um, Typically what happens with these variants is that you will have minor structural changes that uh, do not affect the overall shape of the virus because the, the shape is important for the function of the virus. And in particular, we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, spike protein on the virus and some of the changes to the spike protein. Um, in order for the virus to bind to the cells and gain entry, that spike protein has to have a certain overall shape or else it's not able to do that. However, you can get some minor changes in the spike protein that don't significantly affect the overall shape that might uh, confer an advantage to the virus. It might allow them to spread more easily, gain entry into cells more easily. At the same time, some of those changes, if they're in the right spot or if they're big enough changes, might also prevent antibodies from being able to recognize uh, the, the particular variant. And so that's why this is all important for us when we're talking about variants, especially in light of all the immunizations that are becoming available. So if we can go to the next slide. So uh, the CDC has been tracking a number of different variants and they've identified three of them that seem to have risen to the surface. Uh, the first one that you may have heard of is the UK variant. It's also called B.1.1.7, a very technical name. Um, but that particular variant tends to spread more quickly and more easily than other variants. And so um, there's some early data out there, it's very preliminary, um, that says that it's not any more um, dangerous than, or in terms of the severity of disease, the rate of death uh, than other variants out there. And then very recently, there was some additional data that came out that said it was uh, responsible for more severe cases. And so I'd say the jury is still out on that one in terms of the severity of the disease, but it's pretty well agreed that it spreads more easily. The, the next variant that you're hearing a lot about, and this is going to uh, come come into play when we start talking about uh, the J&J &J vaccine, is the B.1.351 variant that was identified in South Africa, and in fact is the predominant variant in South Africa, more than 95% of cases, uh, according to the J&J &J trial, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So uh, both of these variants, the UK variant and the South African variant, have uh, mutations that slightly affect the spike protein. Uh, so um, they're relatively minor. Um, some of them change the shape just a little bit, not enough to affect the ability of the virus to infect people or get into cells, but maybe enough to impact our ability of antibodies to recognize them. The last variant that's emerging, we don't have a lot of data on this one yet, is the P.1 variant. So this one was identified uh, from travelers from Brazil who actually made it all the way to Japan. Uh, and they were first identified in Japan. And this one also contains multiple mutations, um, some of which also affect um, the spike protein. But most importantly, what's been identified is that this one in particular seems to have some mutations that affect the ability of antibodies to recognize this particular variant. So uh, there are even more variants out there than this, but these are the three that the FDA is really closely monitoring, especially as we start looking at the impact on uh, vaccines. If we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So, so one of the things I wanted to uh, also just bring up to our uh, pharmacist colleagues listening in here is it's so critical uh, with the two dose vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer that you really encourage patients to get their second dose because 
uh, that second dose increases the number of neutralizing antibodies circulating in our system significantly. If you were to look, and we don't have a picture of the graph here, but if you were to look at the production of neutralizing antibodies uh, produced after the first dose of Moderna and Pfizer's product, and then the number of neutralizing antibodies after the second dose, it's at least a tenfold increase, a pretty significant increase. And the best chance of fighting a variant is to have a high uh, quantity of neutralizing antibodies. That's your very best uh, hope for being able to fight off or fend off, not just COVID itself, but the variants that related. So it's very important. So I uh, would just ask Dan and Mitch, tell us a little bit about the J&J &J vaccine. I know the, the two of you have been following this very closely. There's a lot of information that's happened in the last uh, week, I guess, as an EUA was submitted to the FDA. So where are we here? So you probably have actually even more data than we do. Um, we are right now, uh, Basically, we have the information that's available in the Johnson & Johnson press release. So we're still waiting on the full FDA summary of the data to be released. Um, but what we know so far is from a press release. So take it with the uh, appropriately sized grain of salt, and we'll get more clarity in a couple of weeks once this information becomes uh, more widely available. So first off, let's talk about the J&J va &J vaccine platform itself. So this is a genetically modified replication incompetent adenovirus. So adenoviruses are very common. They're a cause of the common cold uh, in many of us. And so we've all seen adenoviruses at some point in our past. So what they've done is they go in and they take out the genetic guts of this virus and cut them up and put them back together. And they put it back together in a way that allows us to deliver the uh, target that we're looking for, in this case, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, uh, but it does not contain the elements that the, the virus itself needs to replicate. So it's basically just a delivery platform, and that's all it is. So we're taking advantage of what viruses do naturally, which is invade cells, uh, in order to deliver DNA in this case. So one of the big advantages of the J&J &J vaccine is that it's a single dose vaccine. So uh, once and done, you don't need a follow-up visit. And so um, certainly a big, a big plus uh, for this. And so according to the press release, this is a very large study, uh, almost 44,000 people in the trial. Uh, overall, a 66% uh, effective rate at preventing moderate to severe COVID-19 disease four weeks after you know, the time of vaccination. In the U.S. population specifically, that number went up to 72%. So great numbers there. Uh, not quite as high as uh, Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. However, again, this is a single dose. So a little bit of a trade-off there, but one that's probably worth it for a lot of folks. Um, it was very effective at preventing severe disease, 85% effective, and 100% effective at preventing COVID-19 related hospitalizations and death. Uh, and then we talked about variants a little bit earlier. And so uh, they did a significant portion of their trial in South Africa, and they saw that uh, this vaccine does have demonstrated efficacy against the B.1.351 uh, variant, although the effect efficacy rate was a little bit lower. It was in the 56, 59% range if memory serves. So uh, definitely some Good. difference. Mitch, uh, would you just uh, real quickly remind our listeners um, uh, what what happens next with the FDA now that the EUA has been submitted? And so, so J and J submitted the EUA application to the FDA. Uh, the open the, the open hearing is scheduled for February 26, and if the path goes the same as the previous two authorized EUAs, um, FDA will spend a whole day looking at the data. Um, possibly. Prob possibly by the end of that day, a recommendation uh, being made that then goes to the uh, ACIP for them to look at and consider and then offer their recommendation. So it could happen over a three-day period like the previous one. Depends on how much data and how much uh, discussions go on. Um, in terms of not just the approval of the vaccine, but I, I presume there's going to be a lot of discussion in terms of uh, populations that the vaccine should be used in. All right, that's great. Well, thanks for that. And I'll just let our audience know now that in two weeks, we plan to focus this webinar on uh, the J&J &J vaccine and provide you with uh, more in-depth details. Once we have the scientific studies, we'll review that with you. Now, uh, Dan, uh, 
a lot has been said about uh, uh, the pain that happens in the arm uh, following vaccination and uh, whether or not you should take acetaminophen or NSAIDs or what you should do. Uh, can you tell us uh, just real briefly, because we're pressed for time, about the NSAIDs and what, uh, what we can and can't recommend to patients or should and shouldn't? Absolutely. So right now, uh, we do not have any data about how the prophylactic use of NSAIDs affects uh, the production of antibodies from the vaccine. So to be conservative, the recommendation is not to use NSAIDs prophylactically uh, and only to use them symptomatically if needed. And so I've got some information on the slide I won't go into just for the sake of time if you want some background about why this is coming up. Um, and you can check out the links there if you want more info. All right, that's great. And uh, also uh, immunocompromised patients, you know, uh, uh, I think if I'm recalling correctly that HIV patients were included in these studies. Can you tell us a little bit about that and were there any other uh, immunocompromised patient populations included in any of these trials? Yeah, another another really common question. So HIV patients, and I should specify these are patients with controlled HIV, not full-blown AIDS or uncontrolled HIV. Um, so con patients with controlled HIV were included in the Pfizer and Moderna trials, as well as the J&J &J trials. We don't have all the data on the J&J &J trial. The numbers were very small, so probably in the you know one to 200 patients with HIV range in, in each trial. So we don't have a great sample. Um, but um, on the whole, and I'll, I'll leave it to Mitch to talk a little bit more about the recommendation for these patients, uh, but we do have some, some good data so far. Okay, all right, and uh, uh, let's ask, uh, just uh, switch over one more slide if we can have the staff switch ahead one more slide for us. Uh, it, the immunosuppressant therapies is something that I want to hear about too, because pharmacists uh, are providing a lot of these to patients, uh, various uh, immunosuppressive regimens. Do we need to be concerned about those with the COVID vaccine? Yeah, this is a, another very common question and, and one we're getting frequently. Um, so patient, unfortunately, patients who are immunosuppressed, whether because of chemotherapy, actively receiving immunosuppressant medications, were excluded from the clinical trials. So we really have very little data uh, about how they respond. The big concern, of course, is that because they're immunosuppressed, they may not mount an immune response. And so uh, there is some guidance from the CDC about that. And I'll leave it to, to Mitch to tell us a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Yeah. Well, Mitch, why don't we just jump into that? Tell us about what the CDC does say about our immunosuppressed patients. Okay, so next slide, uh, we'll have some more information on there. Um, so, so this comes from the CDC clinical guidance. Um, again, what we're looking at is the risk of an individual who might get COVID as, as the target point of what we're trying to prevent. And so the recommendation in a nutshell from CDC is immuno, immuno, immunocompromised patients can receive COVID vaccination if they, don't have, if they have no other contraindications to vaccination. But key in that discussion that you have with the patient is to counsel them again about the unknown vaccine safety, as, as Dan said, you know, there were some that, that, that got through in the trial, but we still don't have complete information on there. Um, also about the potential reduced immune response potentially in these individuals. They also need to, to, even though they get the vaccine, they need to follow the current guidance on protecting themselves against COVID. So the mask wearing, the social distancing and so forth. The other thing that's in the, in the recommendations is you do not have to do antibody testing uh, to assess the immunity of an individual following the vaccination. So we don't have to test to see, did they respond to the vaccine or not? And at this time, revaccination is not recommended after a patient, for example, who's gone through the chemo uh, therapy regimen uh, and, and they get their immune competence back up, they do not have to be revaccinated uh, with any of these vaccines. That could change as more data comes out, but right now that's the recommendation out of CDC. We have a, thanks for that, Mitch, very important. I want to just uh, uh, also mention that we've included a slide here about pregnancy and the use of the vaccine. We're not going to take time now to talk about that. It's a subject that we've covered many times on this webinar. Uh, I would like to just refer our listeners to uh, the uh, CDC's MMWR. Uh, in the last two months, there have been two issues published, one reviewing the safety of the Pfizer vaccine and one reviewing the safety data 
uh, from the Moderna vaccine. And both of those uh, reports actually cover uh, pregnancy and discuss uh, the number of pregnant individuals who receive the vaccine um, and uh, would just point out that there uh, is, in fact, uh, 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 strong statements from a number of organizations that uh, pregnant individuals should be uh, counseled about the vaccine and its availability so that they can make an informed decision about whether or not to be vaccinated. Dan and Mitch, thanks for joining us. I'm going to now move to Claire and ask Claire to join us on screen. Claire Hannon, thank you for being patient uh, as we uh, uh, come to you now to talk to you about some very practical things that a lot of our viewers are pretty interested in today uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this. So thank you so much. You know, what are the current trends that you're seeing and how are our states utilizing pharmacies? That is probably our biggest question. <laughs> Um, sure, and I can understand that. And um, thank you for having me on again. Um, love talking with you. And I think we are in a different place now, certainly than the first time I was on with you. And I think we're in a, a, a good place now. Um, you know, we have made a number of um, accomplishments. I always like to start out with what we're doing well. And one thing that we, you know, have done is built this network of enrolled providers and um, the data flow. It's not perfect, but um, we do have this groundwork laid. And that includes the pharmacies and that includes um, both the long-term care um, facility federal partnership, as well as the retail federal partnership, as well as pharmacies enrolled um, at the state level. Um, so these are really good things. Um, as far as in terms of where we are, as far as like phase 1A, phase 1B, you know, where are we? I think that, you know, almost every state is now really engrossed in phase 1B, focusing um, mostly on those over 65 or over 75. Um, efficiency has really improved. There's been a lot of pressure on states to um, get the vaccine into arms more quickly. So we've seen a lot of movement to large scale, high throughput clinics um, and states have received funding support and resources um, to support this. There is now FEMA support available um, and this is available for states that request it. So, um, and it's, it's everywhere from uh, funding, resources, supplies, staffing, um, all the way to mobile clinics up to large-scale clinic support. So um, I think um, almost every state is in some way working with FEMA, not necessarily having FEMA clinics, um, but in some way getting support from FEMA. That's um, the allocations are increasing. So we're seeing, um, we saw a 5% increase in what was allocated to states two weeks ago, and there's another slight increase this week, 500,000 doses. So we've gone from about 9 million a week, a few weeks ago, to 10.5 million last week, to 11 million um, being allocated to states. And then this week, there's also 1 million being allocated to the federal uh, retail pharmacy program, which we can talk more about. I'm sure you have more questions. Um, and so I, I would say the challenges, the states, um, you know, just really struggling to manage that demand. Um, many are having much, much more success with um, scheduling um, IT apps, um, connecting between, uh, you know, hospital systems and pharmacy systems and their own pre-registration systems. So we're seeing improvement there, but that's still a challenge, um, still a challenge with the data reporting as well. Um, and then, of course, we have the retail pharmacy program starting this week. Um, this is um, deliberately a slow rollout, if you will. Um, I think that the vision for this program really was when supply was very robust in phase two, perhaps, to spread it out to as many access points in the community. And I think we all know that really pharmacies can do such a great job at that. And, you know, lessons learned from 2009, we don't want pharmacies having to enroll in 50 different state programs. So enrolling them in the federal, in the federal program, there's 21 pharmacy chains and giving them vaccine, that was the vision. I think we're seeing, you know, we need to look to that earlier. Um, we need to do that even though supply is limited right now. 
for many reasons. Um, but mostly because we need to get access points that aren't just focused on efficiency, that are focused on getting vaccine into communities. And um, because it's limited, the rollout, it's one million doses. Uh, states are in a position right now to choose which retail pharmacy chains. There's not enough vaccine to go to all of them. So states have chosen. You have a really good um, link there that shows which um, chains are in which states. Um, so that's we, uh, rolling out this week. Can I just interrupt you real quickly? I want to yeah. just uh, point out for our listeners that while Claire's using the term retail chains, I will just say that uh, it's really the networks of pharmacies. So some are chain drugstores and some are actually independent pharmacy networks, uh, uh, maybe headed up by McKesson or CPESN or Amerisource Bergen. And those are being treated as a chain uh, within the network. So I think it's, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Claire, it, uh, it's really the net pharmacy networks or the contracts. And in many cases, those are chains in some cases, it's networks of independence. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for, for pointing that out. And um, I, I, I learn from you every time I'm on here. So um, I will definitely do a better job in the future no, understanding and explaining you, that. Can you tell us, Claire, in terms of, you know, as a million doses released, I think today, actually, if I'm not mistaken, to these uh, retail partners that are getting it, um, you know, what's the goal? What's the target? Is there a target number of doses? Is there a time frame at all that you anticipate? Uh, have you gotten any indication at all from the feds as to when every pharmacy in America might expect to have vaccine available? Um, are we talking summer, fall, or is it a crystal ball right now? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the million dollar question. Um, and and I don't think we really know, but I think they do want to scale up over time. So, and, and I, I mean, if you look at the projections of vaccine with both Pfizer and Moderna saying that they are on pace to have 100 million doses out by the end of March, um, and we've distributed about 65 million right now, then, you know, we could see continued up, uh, increase in allocations. We don't actually know that. We haven't been told that, but I, you know, we could see that. And I would see that retail um, pharmacy program doing that as well. But as far as time frame for like when everyone is going to get um, vaccine, I don't know. And I haven't heard any discussion around that. So, okay. but I think that rather than have, you know, rather than have a light switch, oh, there's a, a, a whole slew of doses. Everybody get some. Um, we they are looking more at at rolling it out over time. So maybe it's a month. I hope it's certainly hope it's not summer or fall. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Good. Well, it's a good it's it's a good thing. We've got uh, some of our listeners today are asking questions, of course, about the federal program. Um, can you uh, share with us uh, some results? I think you've got a slide in here, some results from maybe your members and some situational awareness survey that you conducted. Maybe you could share with us about this. Yeah, so, you know, I think, I think one of the things that we've seen with um, phase 1A and this push towards efficiency is that um, the collaboration and the communication is so important. So, you know, when we're using scheduling apps or pre-registration lists, um, they need to be coordinated with the large scale clinics as well as, you know, community clinics and what's going on um, in uh, pharmacies. So we asked our members, you know, um, how, are, how is this gonna happen? How is this rollout gonna happen when um, the federal government has enrolled these pharmacies, you know, how are you going to coordinate that with what's happening at your state level? We're still in limited supply. You still have people, you know, banging on the door. Where can I get vaccine? You have to be coordinated. And we were really happy to see that every, every, all of our respondents. Now we only had 12, but since then we have had more. All of the respondents, 100%, said yes, they have spoken with the retail pharmacy chains. Um, so this is such a great sign. And so I would encourage, um, you know, if there if there is any anyone that hasn't spoken with their state and needs contact information to, to get in touch with Mike, he can get in touch with me um, okay. and we can arrange that because it's so important that as we do this federal program, we coordinate it with what's already happening at the state level. 
Absolutely. And I want to remind all of our listeners, if you're not a member of your state pharmacy association, please join because the state pharmacy associations are networked very closely with the state departments of health and are working to try to help ensure that access to vaccine occurs both as part of the federal program and as part of the state uh, programs. Uh, just reminding pharmacies that the federal program is not the only way that pharmacies can participate in vaccine rollout. The, the state allocation, in fact, could be using pharmacies to help get the vaccine into arms, as we've seen in West Virginia, Florida, California, many, many other states, Iowa, there are many states that have done that. So we're really excited about that. And just be, please be a part of your state pharmacy association pharmacists. I need to give a plug to those uh, individuals. And I think on the next slide's a little more information that you've shared with us from your situational survey as well. Yeah, so we just asked on a scale of one to five, how do you rate your satisfaction regarding the partnership and collaboration with the pharmacy chains in the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership, and that should say networks. But um, we were really pleased with this uh, because we had um, we had uh, everyone more or less saying they're satisfied or um, above satisfaction. So we had one very satisfied. We had 54% uh, satisfied, and then we had two that said unsatisfied and we were reaching out to them. But when we do this similar type of poll in other areas regarding their communication around allocation, and it, it's, it's, it's not anywhere near this positive. So we were just very excited to see that this collaboration seems to be going on. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a success and this is good. And as we scale up, we hope to see this satisfaction continue. That's great. Now, I will tell you, I, I um, uh, run a very large mass vaccination clinic that's a multidisciplinary clinic here in California. Um, and uh, one of our big concerns, and I know it's a concern for community pharmacies and, uh, and others who are participating, are second doses. There's a lot of worry and concern about whether or not second dose supply is actually going to be there because I think um, within the last month, there's been a lot of uh, uh, news that all of the vaccine supply was being released, nothing was being held back. So can you help us understand this just a little bit? Because I think there's a lot of nervous folks out there wondering, should we be holding back second doses in our refrigerators? Yes. And I mean, there's been some confusing media around this. And I just want to assure everyone that um, second doses are guaranteed. Um, so you should not be holding back doses for second doses. Um, the way that works at the state level is that states receive an allocation of first doses um, early in the week, like on a Tuesday, and then it becomes available for order on a Thursday. It gets inputted, loaded into the VTRAC system. Their second dose allocation is separate. It comes on Sundays and they are ordering it on Sundays. Um, and it is, it is exactly matched to, you know, their previous doses that were allocated, you know, 21 or 28 days earlier. Um, I think where the confusion comes in is that when they have shipments sent to sites, they're not in boxes, in boxes necessarily marked first doses or second doses. Um, so hopefully you are able to tell when you're getting your shipment at a certain point in the week that it's first doses, you are guaranteed to get those second doses. Um, there is, you know, there's been media reports that states, states are running low on second doses or didn't have second doses. Those, I would not trust those media reports. They are getting allocations. Um, those allocations are, are guaranteed. And um, the second doses, you know, you should be giving every dose into an arm and you will get a second dose for that person 21 or 28 days later. That's great. Well, thanks for that clarification. And to our listeners, uh, pharmacist.com. Uh, at uh, the coronavirus resources section. Our staff uh, works very, very hard to ensure that pharmacists have the most up-to-date information that is factual and not uh, by hearsay uh, placed on our website. And we work directly with the agencies and with organizations like AIM to make sure you have 
correct information that's up to date. So if you're ever in doubt and you hear something on the news that doesn't sound quite right, visit pharmacist.com and the coronavirus vaccine resources to help you with this. Now, I want to also just talk about vaccine supply and looking ahead because we did talk about J&J &J coming. So can you tell us what, what's being said nationally about the supply chain? Yeah, so we've, um, you know, we've been receiving updates from Pfizer and Moderna. They both say that they are on pace to get 100 million doses out um, by the end of March. And then the, the government has contracted with Pfizer for another 100 million um, by the end of July and with Moderna for another 100 million. And I think that should say end of June. Um, and of course, the, the Janssen, the Johnson & Johnson, they are contracted for 100 million doses by the end of June, which they say they are on pace for should their vaccine get authorization. Um, we don't have a clear idea of what that means as far as how much is coming off the production line every week. But when you look at this and you look at what, where we are with doses distributed at, at 64 and a half million, you know, over the next eight weeks, seven weeks, it's a lot of doses to reach 200 million. So I feel, you know, I, I just feel very optimistic that supply is going to continue to go up and the allocations are going to continue to go up um, and programs like the federal retail pharmacy program and, you know, now that they are starting an FQHC program, that those programs will also continue to get increased allocated doses. Yeah. Um, Lots of reason for optimism, I think, and hopefulness in, in uh, what we're seeing right now. Yes. I would just say, though, that we don't have those exact numbers, which I think is proving hard, you know, for the Biden administration as well to really estimate out what you're going to get week by week. Yeah. Now we're running low on time, Claire, but I would like to ask uh, but before we wrap up with your section, could you share a few best practices maybe of uh, things you've seen in terms of the jurisdictions? So everybody wants to know, right, why some states seem to be um, at higher percentage dose administered per 100,000 than others. And we did talk to some states and um, you know, really, these are just a few examples, but um, New Mexico does have this um, software or this app that matches supply with demand. So they're able to take names ahead of time and match that with demand. And I hope that they are also able to connect that with um, their pharmacy and other partners as, as more um, providers get vaccine. Uh, but that has certainly helped them. In West Virginia, they uh, have a really strong partnership with their independent pharmacies, um, all of their providers, all of their stakeholders. They did their long-term care facilities um, themselves, but I think they also just have this really cohesive, collaborative partnership. They're focused on one goal, one mission, and um, they're all hands in working on that. Um, North Dakota, and some of the other rural states, uh, you know, we've seen them really focusing on communicating with their providers, um, not allocating uh, batches of vaccine, just actually asking them how much can you use, how much will you use this week, really maintaining that inventory. That's a bit hard to replicate in, in larger states, um, but we still consider it a best practice, that, that relationship with providers. And then, um, Vermont, we thought, did something innovative. I think they did this in South Dakota as well, which was they actually contracted with um, some providers and are paying them to um, give vaccines. So rather than having providers have to bill insurance, have to collect insurance information, um, they're giving them some straight up funding. And, you know, that may be contributing to their uh, higher uh, doses administered as well. Um, and then I, I don't know if you have the other slide in there, but again, I would just emphasize every state is doing things differently and some some tapping into the retail pharmacy program early with their own state allocation, some not. Um, but the key really is the collaboration and the communication. Mm -hmm. We can't have uh, providers, counties, pharmacies, you know, competing against each other for doses. And um what we see in states where things are going well is they have this strong collaboration and communication. So again, I encourage you, if you don't have 
a good relationship or the communication, the collaboration isn't there, reach out to me so I can help coordinate that. That's great. And Claire, we really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for sharing so much wonderful information. Uh, we've learned a lot from you, as we always do. And I'll remind our listeners that at the end of the handouts, there are a number of other things that Claire has provided that contain additional facts and figures and details that you'll find helpful. Claire, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks we'll for having me. We know you're very busy. So thank you for, for being with us. Now, I do want to address one question that the audience had brought up as a point of confusion during uh, the presentation from Dan Slott and uh, Mitch Rothholtz. Um, when talking about immunocompromised patients, there was a statement made that we do not need to revaccinate patients who've received COVID vaccine if they're immunocompromised. Uh, you do need to give two doses if there is a two dose series. And there, there was some confusion about that. Uh, a full primary immunization series for the patient with immunocompromising conditions is important <clears throat> to provide them with protection. There are no booster doses that are indicated at this time for those individuals. So if it's a Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine, they need to complete the full two dose series at the appropriate interval in order to be fully immunized. Now, I want to move on to some important information. While we have been on today's webinar, <clears throat> I've been notified that we've received breaking news from the Department of Health and Human Services. For those of you who join our call, this is not the first time this has happened. When we've been on the line and during our call, we've actually gotten late breaking news from the federal government. And so I've asked Elisa Bernstein if she would please join us to share with us. You will be the first pharmacist in America to hear this news. And so Elisa, please share what is the breaking news out of HHS this morning? Uh, you hyped it so much, Michael, that I am still in the middle of digesting it. But let me share what we've heard. So as many of you know, over the course of the pandemic, for those of you who have been watching, we've been announcing ver at various times, HHS has issued various amendments to the PrEP Act. And the PrEP Act is a law that authorizes the secretary to make special accommodations and flexibilities in order to address the pandemic. And this is where pharmacists have gotten the authorization to uh, prescribe, order, and administer tests and vaccines, COVID vaccines and childhood vaccines. One of the, uh, the Sixth Amendment, which was just published while we were on the line here, gives, expands authority to um, federal government employees, contractors, or volunteers who prescribe, administer, deliver, distribute, or dispense countermeasures, which are like the vaccines or therapeutics. This is intended to increase the pool of people who are available to vaccinate. How this impacts pharmacists, we're, we're still digesting this because pharmacists, as, as I just mentioned, we got authority um, over the course of the, uh, the summer and the fall to vaccinate. Same with pharmacy technicians and pharmacy interns and students. One area that we've been really advocating for in the last week is, is coverage for retired pharmacists, because in the Fifth Amendment that came out uh, about less than 10 days ago, the HHS gave authority for retired physicians and nurses to, who had been in retirement five, for five years to make it easier for them to come out of retirement and vaccinate. Pharmacists were not included. We've been advocating, we've been trying, and in fact, the reason that I, I saw this happen is because I've been looking almost, um, you know, really frequently to see when are they going to add pharmacists because we're we're hopeful that pharmacists will. So this new this new scope increased scope for federal uh, co contractors and volunteers. It looks like it's something that would address some of these really kind of larger mass immunization. Um, venues where the government is sponsoring it. Um, that said, as I said, we're, we're still digesting it, still interpreting it. Um, stay tuned. Um, we will be pushing out more information, um, hopefully later today, that describes exactly what this is and how it impacts you as a pharmacist. 
You're on mute, Michael. I'm sorry. All right. I think you have uh, uh, also a little bit more information to share. I know we're short on time, but uh, you have shown yourself adept at moving through information quickly. So uh, here's uh, you always, you always uh, give me that little bit. So thank you. <laughs> So um, a couple of things to share with you, and, and uh, you know, it, it's hard not to hear in the news what's been happening with respect to the new um, bill. And last week, the House and the Senate passed a budget resolution that really lays the ground rules on how to proceed on the next COVID relief package. This week, the House leaders are conducting markups of this $1.9 trillion legislation, um, and they hope to take up final action next week. Um, hopefully the, the floor will vote the week of February 22nd and then have a final passage um, shortly thereafter. APHA is lobbying to um, get pharmacists included in a few of the provisions of the bill related specifically to vaccines and therapeutics and the national strategy for testing and increasing the public health workforce. I'm not going to go over, but we've just highlighted a couple of the important sections here on the slide. So if we go to the next slide, please. We um, Reimbursement for administration of the vaccine continues to be a challenge for some. Some have found it quite easy. Um, others uh, have been challenged, and particularly if you're still setting up your system and trying to figure out how to get reimbursed. APHA recently updated our uh, resource, our practice resource called Know the Facts. And um, I wanna direct you to that because it's a really great resource and um, really helpful. So we have a practice library where this is one of many. Yeah, and, this is um, a great one. I just have to chime in and say, what a useful resource. If you haven't looked at this reimbursement one, folks, you need to get on there and take a look at it because uh, uh, this is the way you build sustainable uh, practices so that you can reach into your community and immunize everybody against COVID. You need to know how to get paid for that administration fee. Thanks, Michael. And then the other the other uh, resources that I want to highlight for you, this is front and center as you're hearing about how people are struggling, pharmacists are struggling to get that sixth dose out of the Pfizer vial. So the Pfizer vaccine vial originally was labeled for five doses. And when it became clear that there was a bonus dose in there, if you use proper technique to get the last dose out, they now count, consider that there are six doses in that vial. And that's how doses are being ordered and allocated based on that six dose. So what we did at APHA is not only, we, we, we developed two different resources. One is, again, one of those know your know the facts, practice, paper resource for you to look at. It's in our library. But we also just released a 15 on 19, the newest episode of our widely, wildly popular um, CE program. So for just 15 minutes, you can get CE and it shows you, it's a video that shows you some tips and tricks and really what is dead space and why is, why is it important to um, get the right needle and syringe. So highly recommend that you look at both of these resources and share them with others, please. That's great. I think, I think that's it, Michael. All right. Well, thanks, Elisa. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> We've gotten a question in, speaking of CE, uh, from a couple of retired pharmacists who are very interested in becoming certified as immunizers or receiving certificate training uh, uh, through APHA to become an immunizer. Dan Zlot, could you share with us how pharmacists or pharmacy technicians who are looking to be trained uh, to be able to administer vaccines might be able to get that training? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, as you as you can imagine, this is a question we're getting uh, frequently. So uh, the courses are offered uh, through our partners, and we also have an upcoming tech immunization training at uh, our APHA annual meeting. Um, so if you are looking for a class in your area, the best thing to do is to contact education at aphanet.org, email us, and uh, our staff will help you find a class in your area. And that's going to be the quickest way for you to get certified. 
And um, I want to use this opportunity as a, a springboard to talk to you all about APHA 2021, just real briefly. Uh, Dan mentioned that there is the certificate training program will be offered at the APHA 2021 virtual meeting, and it's coming up here in less than a month. Uh, if you have not yet registered for the APHA annual meeting, you need to register. It's being held virtual and significant portions of the program are in fact live. And there are uh, CE programs that you will be able to ac access asynchronously, but you do not want to miss the APHA annual meeting. I don't know about all of you, but I am really ready to connect with pharmacists. I'm ready to get together with other pharmacists uh, as much as possible. What better way to do that than live and during the APHA annual meeting? The time is now, the time is here. We've provided you with the link and I wanna challenge you all, uh, before you close your browser today from today's webinar, just take a few moments and click on that link and get that registration taken care of. I wanna see you at the APHA annual meeting. It's the best opportunity for you to connect with your colleagues and network and get the education you need to be able to carry you through this pandemic. And so uh, we really want to encourage you to do that. I mentioned the Engage platform, I believe, earlier uh, about how you can connect as a member of APHA to the rest of the pharmacists and the association to keep these conversations going. Well, now it's time for us to check your knowledge on those CE questions that we asked you before. Oh, yes, one last thing. We'll be back on Thursday, February the 25th, our plan is to discuss the J&J &J vaccine at that time. If we have any late breaking news that happens, however, we'll have a webinar before then, uh, but we'll let you know. Pharmacist.com uh, slash coronavirus will make you aware if we choose to have a webinar before then, but our next one we plan for Thursday, February the 25th. Now let's cover those CE questions real quick. Let's check your knowledge. Did you learn what type of vaccine the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is? Click on your screens here. Let's get quick responses so we can uh, get you those all important CE codes. I know some of you are anxious to know. Those of you on the West Coast are ready for lunch. Uh, so let's get that. Okay, let's see what our results are. You got it right, 76%. It's a viral vector vaccine. That's great. All right, let's go to the next question. Immunocompromised persons should be counseled on which of the following? Let's see if you learned that one from the slides that were there. We talked a little bit about some of these topics and uh, with uh, uh, Mitch Rothholtz and Dan Zlot. So let's see what your uh, observations are on the answers for these questions. All right, let's see your responses. And 89% of you got it right. Due to a potential for reduced response, follow all guidance for follow-up and protection from COVID-19. So uh, definitely immunocompromised people are going to need all the protection they can get. Vaccination is one way to do it, but we still need masks and social distancing for those. Now let's uh, get the question about the federal pharmacy retail program. And remember, I told you up front that this one's a little bit of a nuanced question. Hopefully you listened close to Claire Hannon and you got the information. Which of the following is true regarding the initial activation? The initial activation of the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program that happened today, 2-11-2021. Uh, and uh, tell us there what you see. All right, let's see what the results are of this question. Yes, you did get it right. Select pharmacies are allocated vaccine supplied directly with the initial allocation. The hope is, is that participating pharmacies more broadly will be able to receive supplies directly once we have adequate supplies to get those out to pharmacies. So very, very good. Uh, you have got uh, great questions and so forth. There are some questions we received today that we didn't get to in our Q&A timeframe. We will try to address some of those at the on the Engage platform. And so please uh, log in to pharmacist.com and check the Engage platform and you can get more information on the COVID-19 resources. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. We hope that you found it informative and enlightening and we wish you the very best as you uh, enter your communities and vaccinate and we'll see you back here. February the 25th, 
Same time, same place. God bless.